guess I gotta look around these posts. Good morning. Good morning. I got to talk to three different groups with the posts in the way. Um, real quick before we get started, um, Dennis introduced me. My name is Scott Mazzula. I uh, represent uh, the Hobart Institute of Welding Technology. I am currently the president and CEO of the organization. Uh, quite an honor, to be quite honest with you. Um, also today, I brought a gentleman with me. His name is Kevin Trick. He's one of our career development coordinators. I brought Kevin along to, uh, uh, to network and to help answer questions that, uh, that I cannot. So uh, when all this, oh, we can start? Yes, let's go. <laughs> Um, so hopefully uh, when this is over, um, Kevin and I get a chance to uh, meet a lot of you, and uh, we certainly uh, encourage questions. Um, how much time I got? Half an hour. Half an hour. Yeah. I better get going. Um, <laughs> right, we'll, we'll make that. We got three screens. Good. Um, I tried to bail on this, but uh, they said I couldn't. So uh, they asked me to do two talks, and I said, well, I really got to bail. And they said, well, how about one? And I said, well, I guess I can do one. I said, but I really didn't have the time to generate a big, lengthy, educational-type presentation. And he said, oh, just perspectives would be great. And I said, all right. I said, but I still don't have time to create anything. And he said, just talk about the school. And this was a guy named Patrick Henry who, yeah. who bailed on us. He's not here. So <laughs> go figure. I tried to bail. He bailed. So, um, so anyways, the goal today is to just introduce the school, a little bit about what we do. Um, how many people here have heard about the school? Virtually everybody. Um, how many people have actually been to the school? Okay. How many alumni do we have here in the room? Just two of us. All right, we've got to change that. Um, so the idea is just to explain a little bit about the school, a little bit about what we do, how we operate, how we function, um, and then kind of go from there. So what it is, I put a presentation together, just more of a reminder for me on things to talk about. Um, but uh, some slides might be a little wordy, so uh, don't get wrapped up in trying to read them. I'll just kind of hit the highlights. If there's any questions along the way, please raise your hand. I'll take them during as well. Um, but uh, certainly after is, uh, is always appreciated. So um, cover page, the school's located in Troy, Ohio, about an hour and a half straight west of here, or east of here, I'm sorry. Um, we're about an hour north of Cincinnati. A um, little bit about the school. The school uh, does have a mission statement. Um, it probably needs to be revamped, but the bottom line of the mission statement is it says we want to be the premier welding training institute worldwide. A um, little bit of arrogance on my part just because of my pride. I believe we're there today, and uh, we just need to figure out ways of the things we do good, how to do them better, and, uh, and to continue to represent the welding industry better. So uh, that's kind of what our mission and our charter is all about. The, uh, <clears throat> the school itself is substantially old. Um, it was founded in 1930 uh, by Hobart Brothers. There's a big misconception in the industry that the, everybody knows that Hobart Brothers, Filler Metals, Miller Electric Manufacturing Company are owned by the same parent company called ITW Illinois Toolworks, right? The industry perception is that Hobart Institute of Welding Technology is a Hobart Brothers company. The reality is the school is not. The school itself is a complete separate entity from ITW. It is a non-profit organization. It is a 501c3. Um, the school technically doesn't have too many employees, but the people that actually manage the school uh, is governed by a board of directors, similar to what the American Welding Society is. And uh, Hobart Brothers employees actually run and operate the school today. So a little bit uh, about the, the structure. Um, trade school was built in 1940. Current facility we are currently in is about 160,000 square feet. Um, it was expanded in 78, and this is actually an exciting year for the school. We just expanded a little over 7,000 square feet. We added 52 new multi-process arc welding booths in the school. Um, we currently run two shifts um, where our enrollment is, uh, is right around 300. So. It's actually pretty substantial. Um, I think I mentioned earlier we got about 266 learning stations. That doesn't include our technical side of the business, so I'll, uh, I'll share some of that with you guys later. Uh, what else does this say? Um, the school is accredited, which is, uh, which is extremely important to us. Um, <clears throat> the school itself 
uh, houses, about 130,000 of the 660,000 square foot facility, uh, 260 plus welding stations. Um, student Job Center, the school is very, uh, very adamant about making sure these students have uh, enough job assistance. Um, if anything, any school, uh, whether it's a community college, a university, whatever the case is, um, one of the main charters of a continuing education or a secondary, post-secondary school is to make sure we have opportunities for students. Um, the welding industry is absolutely incredible. I can tell you today for students uh, on our job board, and Kevin, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we have about 1,200 plus jobs in-house and about 130 employers that, uh, that are currently posting with the school. Um, I believe it's a safe statistic to say that all the schools in this industry combined can't fill the demand for welders today. So it's an incredible industry. It's a very, very high demand and uh, with an incredible shortage. Um, what else about the school? Not a whole lot there, I suppose. Um, this is just a, a quick bullet list of, uh, of polling students, polling alumni, polling industry professionals on why people have a tendency to choose the school. It's funny because over the years, we get a lot of schools that visit. Um, we get schools from New York, and we get schools from Nebraska, and schools from Texas, and they all want to come and visit the institute, <clears throat> which is quite a compliment. I'm not sure if they think there's a silver bullet, but they always want to come and kind of see what we're doing, see what we're about, um, which, is, uh, which is flattering. You know, the school itself, as well known as it is, doesn't really have any silver bullet on why we do what we do. I can tell you what makes our school phenomenal, and probably what makes a lot of your schools phenomenal, um, isn't necessarily the facility or the grounds or the machines or the curriculum we use. I can tell you, just from experience, that it's the heart of these instructors. The instructors are really what make these schools function. Because if you come to the school and you're going to be here five, nine months, a year, however long it is, and you have a bad experience by a bad instructor, He's going to go out and he's going to tell 20, 30, 40 others. He's going to tell his family. And that's what really drives the reputation of these organizations down. But really, it's the instructors and their personality. You know, these instructors, you see them every day. And some days, they're a, you know, they might have a class of 15, 18, 20 students. And these students come from all different demographics. They come from all over the country, globally sometimes. And sometimes, you know, a welding school or any trade school can be the last chance for some of these youth. Uh, can be a last chance maybe for somebody exiting the military, uh, somebody that's in a dead-end job, you know, wherever you say. But it's the experience that these instructors have because on days they have to be a disciplinarian. Some days they're a father figure. You know, some days you know, they're a friend, they're a buddy. Um, but really, it's, uh, you know, if I was going to start a brand new welding school today, I would start with an instructor. I mean, that's where it all starts. So, so anyway, it's a little passionate about that. Um, we do have a Large campus, the one thing the school does is we only teach welding, welding and welding only. A lot of schools have multiple disciplines, multiple things they teach, but, uh, but the school is single focused. Uh, our school has 23 instructors. Um, a lot of them have been there 20, 25, 30 years, and uh, so it's certainly a nice environment. Um, student teacher ratio is low, well over 100,000 graduates come through the school. I actually took it on as a task about uh, two years ago to count all the students that have ever came to the school. Um, just based on records alone, I think I got to about 109,000 and uh, I, I gave up. It was, just, it was getting very, very difficult when you start getting back into the 60s and 50s and 40s. It was, uh, it was enough. But what I came out of that was it was a bunch. Um, what else we got? The school's very heavy hands-on. When we look at it from a business perspective, when we say, hey, why do people already business? Whether you're selling machines or for filler motors, whatever the case is, is why do people buy from you, right? Why, why do people come back and purchase from your organization? What we found in our schools is that there's a couple of the reasons why people decide to come. I mean, why do people make the decision to physically come to this school? Um, we don't necessarily get out and benchmark against some of the schools. We just really focus on what we're all about. One of the key things is opportunities, that if the industry didn't have a lot of opportunities available to these potential students, and maybe they may not come. Uh, 
So that, that's really where we try and focus is making sure that we do not guarantee job placement, but we make sure that we have plenty of opportunities available. And we try and make sure that the opportunities are as diverse as our students. So we try and make sure we have relationships with organizations in every state throughout the country because our students come from just about every state throughout the country. Um, programs are short. Hobart Institute's considered a career college. So you got universities, community colleges, and then a the group of career colleges, and we fall in that uh, career college category. Um, the school itself, for lack of better terms, has, we can, we can call them business units, but the core of our school is skill training. Individuals wanting to get a skill, a trade, they actually want to get into the welding industry, which is really great to see. Um, all of us in this room, and I don't know really many of you, but I think that should be a primary charter of everybody in this room about how great of a welding industry it is to convince youth, females, I mean, we're looking at talking to you know, the women in welding programs, we're talking to second chance adults, we're doing a lot with veterans. Um, the, the old saying, I'm sure AWS has a lot, a lot of statistics about the average age of a welder is 55 and they're retiring at a rapid rate, we don't have enough people coming in the industry. But when we look at people coming in the industry, we always have a tendency to, to kind of focus on the youth. You know, we gotta get more youth, youth, youth. But there's, that's just one. You know, the second largest regeneration pool of people to get into the welding industry is military, right? Veterans, because benefits don't only extend to the veteran, but it also extends to their families, their spouses and their children and those sort of things. So, so I think all of us as a whole can, can do a good job promoting uh, careers in welding to uh, not just the youth, but different demographics across the board. Um, back to the, uh, to the business unit, so to speak. Um, the school offers skill training where students come in for five or nine months and they're learning how to weld. Uh, the second thing we do is we do a lot of technical training. We'll see over a thousand students this year in our technical training department. What we do is we offer CWI preparation programs, we do CWS, we do a lot of other courses that focus around arc welding inspection and quality control and visual inspection. Uh, welding for the non-welder. These are classes for corporate students that come in for a, a week or two and then they're, and then they're back into their, into their life. Um, corporate services, we have a complete group that focuses on dispatching instructors to the field. We also have a lot of organizations in the school weekly. They're learning how to do specialized, whether it's TIG welding or two inch pipe or flux core or MIG aluminum or whatever the case is. We seem to have companies in the school every week. Um, and then as <coughs> Dennis mentioned, uh, we are an ATF. Um, uh, we, uh, we do a lot of certifications annually. It's, uh, it's good business for us. We do it for uh, uh, all of our students, our complete student population. And then we also do it for a lot of industry clients that we've had relationships with for a lot of years. And then, uh, and then curriculum. Curriculum would be the other core competence of the school. Uh, I know there's, there's the NCCER, there's the SENSE programs. Uh, Hobart Institute does generate and create and author all of its own curriculum, all the DVDs and all the books. So we have a, a large studio there at the school set up uh, with cameras and lighting and, uh, and we shoot all of our curriculum. I can tell you our curriculum is all code based. So everything we teach our students, everything we sell out of the bookstore, um, is all based on codes, ASME, API 1104, AWS standards. So we are actually teaching our students to what code that the industries are requiring. Um, when our students leave, they have the opportunity over the course of a nine month program um, that they can leave the school with four AWS QC7 certifications, which those are the certifications that actually transfer with the student. Um, it's not that the student has a lot of experience uh, in the industry when they're graduating, but leaving the school with these four certifications in their pocket really make them marketable, right? Being a certified welder means that you can generally pass some of these very stringent tests in the entire industry. So if you take a young man or a young woman that has no experience, he's gonna take an entry level job, but yet he's able to pass these stringent tests that really resonates to these employers. And uh, it's, it's really, really a nice feather in their cap. So uh, really important for our students. Uh, to leave with those uh, with those QC7 certs. Uh, the fourth one we added this year was a TIG titanium x-ray, so really, really a nice one, really a nice one, really popular. Um, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll move on.
Any questions so far? No? Good. Um, offerings continue. I keep bobbing because there's a glare on the wall, so I apologize. Make people dizzy. Um, we do have uh, our offerings continue. We do have a, uh, a bookstore that sells uh, all the training material, a bunch of swag, you know, whatever else you're looking for. Uh, the student job placement. Um, I've mentioned it a couple times on how important this is to us. Um, alliances with organizations nationally are very important to us as well. This is something that, uh, that we don't sell. It's a free service to these companies. But um, I gave you guys a little bit of the statistics on how many jobs we had in-house, and that's, uh, that's important to us. And the goal is to continue to grow that. So there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, we do have a library. Um, uh, I was told it was the largest privately owned uh, library in the country. Um, it's all, uh, we get students in and we tell them, you know, hey, there's no Harry Potter, there's no Twilight, there's, there's no Dr. Seuss in this library. It's all uh, metals and welding and, and the parents have a tendency to peek up, but then the student puts his head down and uh, wants to know how much time in the library he's got to spend. But, uh, um, and then uh, in 2010, we uh, created a uh, uh, history of uh, welding. Uh, gallery up in uh, uh, up in the facility. You know, we just had a speaker the other day came in and he gave a talk on the history of welding. This is a gentleman that uh, was the previous president and CEO of the school. Uh, his name is Andre Odermatt. He actually started his career with Hobart Brothers in 1964. He actually talked to a group of instructors we had at our school for about an hour and he took them on a journey of welding history. I'm not a really big history buff. Um, but when you listen to a man like this that's given his life and his career to the welding industry in multiple capacities, and he starts talking about back in the BC era where copper and brass was found in China to where all these different processes were made and where uh, the founder of Lincoln and the founder of Hobart and the founder of Miller Electric really kind of came into play throughout the history. Um, even though I don't have a big, big interest in, in history as a whole, but to hear a person like that talk about the history of welding, you just don't hear people talk like that anymore. I think those kind of conversations are going away. But when you really listen to them and you really read on the board throughout this whole museum that we have about, about the start of welding to where it's at today, it's an absolutely incredible journey. It's really a, it really gives you appreciation on the, what all the founders of these large organizations in the welding business have left us uh, to continue on. and. Uh, uh, so with that in mind, I kind of applaud what AWS is doing and keeping, the, keeping welding in the forefront. So we just try and do our part. Um, the school, um, the welding industry has several markets. Uh, we see a lot of, uh, a lot of growth in, uh, in a lot of these markets, a lot of sustainability. Um, I listed all these markets serve because we currently have jobs in-house that touch every one of these markets. Um, structural steel, metal fabrication, aerospace, oil and gas, automotive, shipbuilding, consumer products, pipe fitters, iron workers are in all the time, alternative energy, mining, heavy equipment. Um, so we try and cover the industry as a whole, not just as a, into specific segments. Um, marketing communications, um, if anybody wants to learn more about the school, um, you know, we're plastered all over the internet, you know, we're on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn, and we got our websites, and we produce a magazine quarterly called The World of Welding, you know, which is free of charge. Uh, you can get all that. Uh, you know, this is such a, uh, uh, a social media world. I don't think it's going anywhere. I think the world's just made a fundamental shift into social media. We've actually started coaching all of our students. Um, our students, they uh, got a lot of volume, and they start every four weeks, and they graduate every four weeks. So we got a new group coming in uh, once a month. But... Uh, a lot of the focus has shifted from make sure you get your resume done to make sure you have a good social profile because employers are looking at it. I think the days of resumes are kind of going away, the paper resumes. I think uh, the days of seeing people black and white on a sheet of paper um, are starting to fade. I think resumes are getting somewhat boring and uh, I think a lot of employers are looking at what their social media profile is. Um, you know, we all carry smartphones and we can look at somebody's profile in a matter of seconds instead of waiting for an email to, uh, to come across with your, uh, your resume faxed or email. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, communications of the school. Um, 
and then we're really focused on military veterans. Um, the school is a military friendly school, uh, which is quite uh, extensive to get that. Uh, I noticed there was a lot of schools that, uh, that are getting it. It's a big, big effort to, uh, to get that, uh, that insignia. Um, what was interesting is uh, when I took over, I had access to uh, board of directors reports dating back to 1931, um, where nothing was typed, everything was on yellow paper, paper was real thick, and everything was in cursive. Anybody know what cursive is anymore? <laughs> My daughter says that's not easy. She can't even Google the word cursive. It don't exist. But, uh, but, it, but it shows that the school's been accepting GI dollars back since 1943. Uh, at one time during World War II, the school's enrollment was about 95, and 94 were women because all the men were off fighting the war, and the women were left to learn these skilled trades and uh, work in the factories. It's pretty neat. But... Uh, uh, the thing with, tr with training veterans, it's certainly an honor. And uh, what I've tried to tell groups is that uh, hiring a veteran is, a, is an investment. It is not a charity, right? We see all these things on the veterans returning from war. You know, a lot of them uh, have certain conditions. And sometimes we feel obligated uh, that it's a charity to kind of, you know, say hi to them or whatever. And I think that's kind of wrong, right? Uh, what we find is that employers that are hiring veterans are really, really getting a great investment, and, uh, and that's the way we try to promote them. Um, so, anyways, a little bit of a soapbox there. Danced around a little bit. Yeah, so, so questions? questions? Yeah, please. Questions for myself or Kevin? Yeah.